So first things first, right? Presenting myself. Uh, a lot of people here already know me. I'm Tiago Duque. I software engineer here at Beyond. I've been working with Python backend and uh, databases uh, for the backend uh, for about five years. And also before that, I even messed with some of the infrastructural parts related to databases. And uh, the thing here today, and I have to remove the Zoom thing from here, <laughs> is that I will go through a quick introductory and some curiosities uh, for data storage and databases. So uh, this is not, this uh, presentation is not intended for technical, very complex, detailed pres uh, presentation, but it's rather like an introduction or a some very expanding the horizons because even developers like me, sometimes we know a lot about one type of database, but we miss some details about another type. And the idea here is to be able to cover uh, a, a large range of databases and applications uh, while still not going too deep into them. So this is, let me go to the next screen. This is the index, pun intended, and the pun was not mine. It was Mikhail with our helper host here. Uh, and the idea here is the topics that we're going to cover. And in databases, indexes are used to quickly find data. So that's why there's a pun here. And so we're going to first some history introduction, then a quick definition of databases. We'll talk about types of databases and we'll jump to a conclusion. And after that, we're going to have a game. And in this game, we'll see how, how much attention did you pay to all of this, your knowledge and, and how fast you are at answering quizzes, right? So moving on, a brief time travel. Let's talk about the transformation of data storage, the databases, how they uh, started. Not going too much detail, but these two pictures that we see here, this big thing here is a magnetic drum database. One of the first ways to store data, it was this gigantic drum that they could encode using magnetic uh, information, just like hard disks do, but it was much bigger, not universal. You didn't have all these uh, standards that we have for hard disks today or yesterday <laughs> or a little time ago, actually, because nowadays we're moving away from uh, the magnetic drives, but it was kind of the predecessor. Then there were also those punch cards where you would punch the numbers and, and store data in paper. There are uh, tapes like VHS tapes that can store data. They are being used up today to store large quantity of data for a long time because they have a large durability. But we're not talking about storage mediums. We're talking about storing stuff in these storage mediums. Of course, they affect how you store them. but uh, when we're starting to uh, talk about this, we're going deeper into how things started to be specialized the way that data is stored. So let's go back in time and think about the early history of storing data in one of those drives that we just mentioned. So one, originally, that's, that's basically what we would hear in the first class of a database uh, lesson in a university, you would get this introduction, right? And this is what I'm doing right now for those who do not, does not have a background in databases uh, in software engineering. Uh, so you had the file systems that were developed a long time ago that you could store data independent of the medium that we mentioned, we mentioned many mediums. And what people would do, they would create these files with, which were actually uh, partitions of bits compressed into bytes and whatever the system could understand, right? 
and they were there in your file system. You had some way to interact with them. So you had a file system and files inside the file system. And people would create the files and navigate through them, just like you had your Google Drive. You have your Google Drive, your SharePoint, your Dropbox, and you create your files over there and leave. And, and when you have to search, you, you go looking for your file. But imagine when we start talking about uh, software applications and having to retrieve this information, the correct file with the correct data, because this is, was, this is how the, file, the data was stored in the past. So you had files with content inside the files, maybe some speci special fields to describe what each content mentioned, but that depended on the system. And someone would have to look for the file, find the correct file. Oh, this is the user they want, get the data from that user, and then log the user into the system or something like that. And to a large extent, if you look at Linux today, everything is file oriented. You have files with information. But it's a simple, interesting idea, but it's problematic. Why is that? Let's move to the next slide. So, with some time, and that happened to me, and it may have happened to you, or Google Drives or Dropboxes become a mess. You have all files with different typings and names, and you, you might have two files for the same information. And these two files, one is outdated, the other is updated. So how to find the most recent information? How to properly get to the file quickly? Because that's an important thing. You don't want to go over 1 billion files to find out that your file, the one, the one that you want is the last one. And imagine that in the times of disks that were very slow, even slower than the uh, magnetic drives that we have today. So at that time, things start to get complicated. If you had that data duplication, you would have a mess. You would have difficulty sharing data and security. How would you ensure that only the correct person can access the correct entry in data? So you get a mess. Now we start to question, should we develop a system for that? Yes, that's what most uh, institutions and companies using computers to do their work started to do. They started to create their own systems to find files and find the information from the files. And there's another issue with that because every system created their own way to access data, to retrieve, to index, to find things quickly. You could not share one file between one database from one company to another company because they would be totally different. And imagine an engineer or anyone working in the technical field, they would have to learn everything from scratch every time, every time they, want, they go to a new company. This lack of universally, universalization was an issue. Like when you have dialects or different ways of speaking things. It, they may look the same thing, but they're not. So then, something happened. They uh, some companies started to develop what are called the database management systems or DBMSs. These are universal systems and languages that provide ways to communicate more easily between systems. So database management systems are ways to uh, build up a lot of features related to data in a single common shared way and language. So that's the start of, the, of, the, of everything. And the benefits from that is that you start to ensure things that before it was very hard. So you have a single system, you can develop it better and you can share it and other people would provide ideas and then you get data integrity you enhance data access, as it's saying here, the better security and concurrency, which is another big thing we're starting to be dealt with. So concurrency is this thing 
when two people try to access the same file at the same time. Think about a bank. You're going to your bank and you're withdrawing $100 from your bank account. Imagine if at the same time, your, some, your friend that you gave your account to, you shouldn't, but you did, you provided him with your account information. And at the same time, he accessed your account and saw that you had a hundred bucks. And immediately he also made another withdrawal. If the system couldn't handle this fact of two access at the same time and dealing with it correctly, the bank would lose $100. Or you could even not have anything, more, not withdraw anything, but there would be a conflict. So concurrency is a big thing. And database management systems are the, one of the tools that solve this issue with data, right? And when we talk about history, let us give some names. So in the 1950s, American Airlines started to it became one of the first commercial airline companies in the world. And now we're talking about moving passengers across the world, across different places, selling reservations, seats, flights, and managing all of this in paper. Imagine how messy was that? Now imagine they starting to add that to a database and they wanted to make sure that the files from uh, this, uh, the details about this flight matches the details about this reservation. Imagine how to do that in one of those systems that you had to develop everything. And then you had to deploy it in another place, in another country. So things start to get complicated here, as you can say, as you can see. So American Airlines uh, developed the Sabre system or Saber, I, I, that, 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 there's some mystery about that word, but this system is their reservation system up to date. And from 1960s on, they developed this computer system that allowed them to make the reservations and manage the reservations and the flight seats and everything. And it was one of the first ones employed commercially that used a database management system with details such as this one that I mentioned concurrency, security, et cetera, because you cannot just leave it as is for anyone to reserve anything, right? And that was a big change because that was very successful. Sabre exists up today. It's not the funniest system to interact with. I already had to work with it. It's not the funniest one nowadays because we're talking about 60 years of history, but it still lives, still works. And you can see the effect just by it. Right, and that allowed for better uh, management, better prices, increasing efficiency, customer satisfaction because everything was smoother. So it was a big thing, and that was a moment where database management systems started to sprout to appear everywhere. And this is kind of more or less the timeline of this development of these systems. So 1960s, the first time a database management system was kind of developed and the Apollo moon mission had one such system. It was not a DBMS by itself, but something similar, information management system by IBM. So we can see that this was not commercial. This was scientific, but it was there. It was one of the first uh, founder stones right there up to the, development of database management systems. In the 1970s, we see Oracle releasing the first commercial SQL RDBMS. Well, what is this, all this soup letter? We'll talk about it, but in a minute. And it is, in this decade, the Sabre became a active functional system, right? Uh, also in 70s, there is this introduction to the relational model that we're going to talk in a minute. In the 80s, we get the standardization of SQL language. What is SQL? SQL is a acronym for Structured Query Language. It's a language to query a database and get the information that you want. 
And it's a big thing that it has been standardized because database management systems, DBMSs, started to implement it. Nowadays, if you go to a database like MySQL, you can use SQL to query it. If you go to Postgres, you can do the same. If you go to BigQuery, which is not a relational database per se, you can do that because they implement the SQL language. And you can talk about many different database systems that use SQL. And that was a big thing because now you don't have to learn 20 different dialects or better 20 languages to talk to the database. You have a single standardized language, or actually it's not a, the single one, but a very important one. And this is the, the this is the year also that Microsoft founded their, their SQL server. It's a big thing because Oracle and Microsoft are one of the biggest commercial providers of relational databases. And we'll talk more about this in a minute. 1990s, there's a big growth in database systems because of internet. Not, nothing else uh, to add. You, you know what internet is and what it made to computers and programming, right? The 2000s, we see MySQL, a big name. Uh, and most of people here who studied uh, computer science, uh, computer software engineering, they probably learned with MySQL, which was a very popular, freely available open source database. Nowadays, it is not open source anymore. It belongs to Oracle, but there's MariaDB, which is their open source version. And we start seeing at the same time, NoSQL arise. Database like MongoDB, which is very famous, very used today, which does not comply to the SQL standard. It's a different thing. Uh, was created in the 2000s. I think 2007, it was starting to show up and it was another change in database history. And then we can see it continues new things being created. Nowadays, we are in the in times of IoT with 4G, 5G. You have all these devices sending information, internet of things, your uh, smart home, uh, these things, they require some specific information about their sensors and their placing time. And that's, that brings an, a new problem because databases, usually they didn't receive a lot of uh, information at the same time, or if they did, it was a big system you could scale up. But now even small things send a lot of information in a few, in a small uh, span of time. And if you have millions of those connected at the same time, you get a problem. And that's why time series databases are every day becoming a more important topic in a discussion about databases. And the cloud, of course, that cannot be forgotten. So what are databases? We talked about this word, database management system, but, in, but quickly, a database is an organized collection of structured data that enables efficient storage retrieval and management of information. So there, it's very important, this thing, to store, retrieve, and manage. Without that, you don't have a database. You have files, data, data sets. But we're talking about databases here, right? So the first type of database systems or database management systems that we're going to talk about are the relational databases. Now, quick... Uh, Quick information here. I'm going to talk about different types of database management systems. And I will talk about them in sequence, but don't think that this sequence means that this one is more primitive or old or worse than the next one. They might, some of them might be older, that's true, but you'll see that each one has its place and application. And if I'm talking about them here, now is because they're still being used and they're very important. So don't think that the sequence tells us that these, this one is better than the previous one, because that's not the case. So talking about relational databases. So relational databases are databases that are focused on relationships. And they are one of the first ones to become widely popular. 
And the relational databases has this concept of tables, columns, and rows. So a table, like an Excel spreadsheet, has columns and rows. And these rows contain data. They are usually pretty fine. You have the, the columns with their specific types. And within the rows, you have to follow rules for each column to fill the data. And the thing here is the relationship, because you can have a relationship between one table and another table. And that is ensured by primary keys and foreign keys. So a foreign key is a field, a column, that points to another table into their primary key. And this ensures that two tables, they are related to each other. And this is a big feature in the relational database because it ensures data consistency. And another thing about these databases is that you can configure them. If you delete one of them, the other one that is related is deleted, or you get an error because you cannot delete these before you delete this other one. You can configure that, and that allows you for to manage your data and ensure that you're not losing things without seeing them. So a big thing. And relational databases use SQL for data manipulation and retrieval. That's uh, the kind of, th their, their language is that one. And it, at the right here, you can see some examples, MySQL, PostgreSQL, Oracle, all of them use SQL. So if you learn how to write queries for MySQL, you'll probably be able to do the same thing in PostgreSQL, even though they have some differences, right? But, the, but this is a big thing about relational databases. They're being used up today. They can go to millions, billions, trillions of rows. They have very good qualities. But now let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages. And here you can see a relational model that you usually create to model a database, a relational database, right? But that can be used for any other type of database to, to model them as well. So advantages of relational databases. Strong data consistency and integrity because of these keys, these, these rules that you create. It's easy to model some complex relationships, but not too complex. We're talking about tables that relate to each other, but we're not talking about 20 levels of relationships. You can do that, but it won't be a nice developer experience for a developer working with that. So it's, a, it, it's easy to model, easy to think about it, but it's not the most appropriate database for big chains of relationships. We'll talk about that in a few slides as well. There's wide range of support and tools available. This is one of the oldest ones. You have a bunch of information, courses, books, et cetera. So this is the first one to go to definitely if you want to start somewhere. Now, the disadvantages is that depending on how you implement them, they can be less performant at scale because of all these relationships that you have to ensure, all these uh, rules that you have to ensure than some other types of databases. But that's, uh, that's uh, an exchange that you have to do. Data consistency and integrity and a little less performance. But even though some modern uh, relational databases do very well with complex and lots of data, that's something that has to be acknowledged. Another disadvantage is the limited flexibility in schema changes. Remember that I said that each column had their types, have their types. So you define a table and you fill in data into that table and you tell, oh, this field, this column called name is a string, is a text, and it can accept only 20 character characters. Now you want to increase that. You have to modify that scheme. Okay, that is kind of easy. You just add, allow more string to be added, more, more, more characters to be added. But imagine that you have the opposite. Now you have to ensure that this column only has 10 characters. So how would you deal with old data? You would have to do some kind of processing that can be expensive, especially if you have billions of rows. So these changes in the schema, in how the data is organized, they are at the disadvantage of a relational database. So for very fast moving ideas and companies, this might not be the best fit. 
Also, if you're talking about data that is not structured or hierarchical, files that doesn't follow the same schema uh, or don't have any hierarchy, it's not a good thing for, it's not the, the best thing to use that for it, right? There are the database systems, database management systems that perform much better. What about NoSQL? So this is the next one that we're going to talk about. And by the name, you know that there's no SQL being used here. But the big, biggest thing is that you're talking about non-relational databases. And this is an umbrella term. What do we mean by an umbrella term? Is a term that covers different types of databases and not only those, uh, it's not, it doesn't relate to a single type of database. And we'll talk about different types in the next slide. So you have different data models, and that's the thing that I'm talking about. One feature is that you allow it for easier horizontal scalability. And what is this of, that we're talking about, scalability, vertical, and horizontal? So ver vertical scalability is when you can increase the power of your system by adding more resources to it. For example, we have a computer with eight gigabytes of RAM and a processor that does with four, four cores. And this is low for your database. You can increase it, uh, you can scale it vertically by moving to another machine with eight cores and 16 gigabytes of RAM. So this is vertical scalability when you add more resources to solve a problem. But with that, you get to a limit. You cannot just keep adding more resources to your system because there's, you, you, you have only uh, so much cores that the maximum uh, um, chip can have and so much, only so much memory that you can have in a motherboard. So you cannot scale vertically for too long. Someday, if you go on Google size, you have to think about another, another solution. And the other solution is horizontal scalability, which is instead of adding more resources, you can add other computers and they can work together to serve your database. You can share the data about, uh, between them. You can make them uh, uh, work together. If one fails, the other one takes it, or if this, uh, it, this, this, this dies, you have a copy in the other machine and so on. So horizontal scalability is a big thing in this era that things grow very fast and lots of data are flowing. And another feature of NoSQL databases are the schemaless or flexible schema design. So usually you don't have that thing that you define which column accepts what. It's more fluid, more it accepts more details, uh, more changes without a lot of problem. It's usually up to the application, to your program, to decide uh, which is uh, the structure that you want your system, your, your database to have, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll skip the examples because we're talking about them here. So there are some types. These are four of them. There are other types of NoSQL database, but these are the core. So you have document databases like JSON, BSON are the types of documents. JSON is JavaScript object notation. And BSON is a, a, a variation of JSON that's used by MongoDB. So these databases, they basically store files. It's, it's like if we go back in time to those days where files were being stored. Actually, all databases store information in files, but different type, styles of files. But a MongoDB file basically is something that you can read and understand. But that's not the thing here. It's, it's not important because you can read it if you're decoded, of course, but uh, this is not the important thing. But the thing that uh, when you store these files like that, you can provide a structure as, as, as you want. So a JSON, you can nest fields. So you can just go nesting fields into this schema for Mongo up to a limit and create your database like that. And it's very easy, very scalable, very fast. And it's 
it's very good for especially when you have a lot of changes in your schema you you have you're in a company that grows too fast and you're not worried about uh, these uh, relationships being very uh, well dealt with or integrity things that's a big thing so another type is the key value which is when you store data a key value pair is basically that so in redis you have that in dynamodb you have that key value is like uh, name john key is name john is the value and you just throw that into the database they are usually used for these types of databases that are storing information, cache information, very fast information, and that you don't worry about having duplicates a lot, and because they're just a, uh, they're a simpler type of database for specific cases, right? We we'll talk about Redis in a few slides. They're also the columnar database where instead of having a table with a lot of information, you have a single column of a single type with, in, with information in that single column, and that's it. And uh, this allows you for, to store a lot of information of a single type very easily and without too much, much hassle. Then afterwards, you, you make the combination between these columns, but that's the, the, the main thing about the column databases and the graph databases. So what is a graph? A graph is like a network where you have nodes, and relationships between these nodes. And this type of database, you can store information like this with a node and uh, this entry in the database, and you have a pointer to another entry. And this is very good for relationship storing. Uh, this is even better than relational database if you're talking about a, 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 a thing like Amazon or like uh, Facebook or Instagram, where you have a lot of relationships between people and you want to uh, start these relationships but if you do that using a database a relational database you have long chains of relationship between the nodes so a graph database helps you that with protein uh, 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 storage because proteins have this all these big chains of um, components right the enzymes and so these graph databases have very, they are very useful in these cases where you have this lot of relationships and you want to use that, that, that structure for something. So those, this is another type of uh, no SQL databases. A big name here is Neo, Neo4j, uh, which is being used in a lot of places today. So here, here at the bottom, you can see here this, this graph. This is what I'm talking about, the graph, right? The relationship. Now, so some advantage, advantages and disadvantages of this general group of NoSQL, right? Is this uh, general flex, greater flexibility and adaptability because of the schema changes, scalability, better performance for specific use cases. Why specific? If you have some relation, relational data and you're using some kind of um, MongoDB, for example, to store it, you might be slower if you do that, if you did that instead using a relational database. So it, it has, it, it, it requires you to understand your data and adapt properly. It's not just, oh, let's go for no SQL because it's much better. No, there are different applications for it, right? Uh, and the disadvantages are here. Weaker data consistency and integrity because your schema is flexible. You also have less mature ecosystem because these systems are, these databases are new, still being developed. Some of are already there and for a while, but still not every people use them or know them. Uh, and if you have different data models and you, ev you evolve in time these data models, then what happens is that it's very complex to manage them. If you have a MongoDB database and you have documents in 30 different formats, so you, you're starting to get a problem there. So you have to deal with them re retroactively and your code will be a mess in the end. Side note here for Elasticsearch, this is not a database, but it is 
closely related to the idea of NoSQL databases. And the thing here is that Elasticsearch is this engine, this tool for text search. It allows for a very fast and good text search. And we're talking about, uh, you have a name, John Claude Van Damme, for example. And this name, you, you don't know the name completely. You just know, know Van Damme. And you want to search only for Van Damme. If you search it in a relational database or any other database, what you end up doing is going through all the entries in the database, getting the text for that entry, then checking all the characters in that text entry to see if they match your string. And this is very slow. I've seen instances of a single query that took 15 seconds in a very small database, talking about millions of rows, not something too big. What is the solution for that? There are other solutions. Even Postgres, for example, has uh, one way to index these textual fields, but uh, it takes three times the amount, the size of your database or your column, your, your table to store it. But Elasticsearch, it does this text indexing and allows you to do this text search with a much less uh, footprint in memory size. It's very fast and it's great. So it's very useful for log analysis, for search functionality, for product search and filtering, as it says here. And even for real-time data monitoring and analysis, it's so you can define it to find some specific entries and logs being created and create alerts for you. So it's a big tool. It's usually coupled with other databases. Like it, it works like an index to a database. And I wanted to bring it here because this is a big one to, to know because it, it has a lot of applications. It might be your case. Now, other types of databases, this is no, not no SQL. This is new SQL. And it's new, but it's not too new. 2010 is on and depends on who you ask, right? And this new SQL databases, they were supposed to get the best of both worlds. Some of the flexibility, some of the uh, scalability and qualities of new SQL with relational databases support, with SQL support. And this thing called ACID, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, which is very important for your data. If you want to ensure that your data lives well through the time. Uh, there are some features which SQL support, horizontal scalability, multiple nodes, and strong consistency and high performance. And one example of, uh, that I'll mention is CockroachDB, which even is this uh, icon here which is this database that uh, people it, it call CockroachDB because it's very hard to take it down. And like killing a cockroach is very hard. So that's where the name came from. And that's the idea, a very reliable database that allows you to do SQL. What are the advantages? Well, you may think, oh, there are only advantages. Yes, there are some good advantages with them, but there are disadvantages. So you have the benefits of relational and NoSQL databases combined. It's very easy, it, it's scalable, and that's important for uh, databases in 2023 and forward. It's good for new applications. But the biggest disadvantage is that they are complex to deploy because there are too many parts to, to make sure that they work as we're saying, they're reliable, and scalable. So it's not something that a developer would just click a button and everything will go up. So that adds some complexity and it's at the disadvantage. Besides, there are not too many people who knows it and not too many forums where you can find information. And depending on the use case, adding all this infrastructure, all these things to make it a system reliable, may cause it to lose performance. And that's not what we want, right? So that's a trade-off. That's a disadvantage of new SQL. 
In memory databases, we kind of already mentioned, but this is a big thing here because they are not databases in the common sense that you have this data that you store and you can come back, but it's something that is used for very fast operations. So there's this idea of secondary and primary memory in computer uh, architecture. Basically, main memory or the primary memory is your RAM, the information that is that lives close to the CPU and is very fast. The secondary memory is your HD, where you store the bulk of your information and when you turn off your computer, it remains there. Your RAM does not, it dies when you turn off your computer. In memory databases are supposed to use this very fast volatile memory for very fast operations. So you can, if you need very fast responses, that's what it's going to, to use. So you have applications that are faster, but if your database goes down, you lose it. So it's usually used for caching, for quick things that uh, they're not very, there's not a big deal if they die, right? Because uh, you, you, it's not something that you lose and have problems. So usually they sit between the application and the real database kind of managing and allowing for faster access in the middle, right? So that's what memory databases are. And the most common well-known is Redis, which is the symbol right here. This might change soon because now we're starting to have HDs, which are almost as fast as RAM main memories. And that's a neat thing to look for in the next few years. And you can even Google about it. You have SSDs, the NVMe SSDs today that are fa as fast as memory, as RAM memory. So advantages, ultra low latency and high throughput because they're very fast and sitting by the side of the CPU. Real time analytics and processing, that's a big thing because maybe you need to take decisions very fast if your machine is going to break. And you cannot just rely to go back to the database and fetch information and store information. So that's one application and that advantage. And it allows for easing uh, database architect or application architecture because you don't have to worry about uh, caching in your application, but you leave that for this intermediary database. The disadvantage is higher cost because you're using a faster and more expensive and more limited resource, which is the RAM. Uh, it's limited to the amount of RAM that you have. You can have, nowadays you can have terabytes of RAM in a machine, but a few years ago, you couldn't have that. And you, you can scale that up to, to bigger numbers today and still say that you have more access to main or secondary memory in large quantities than in RAM, but still, uh, there's a, the, this thing of the limitation of memory is a still a thing for most people using in memory databases, especially because of the price, right? And potential, potential data loss that's already been discussed. If you turn off, you lose everything. And if you didn't save that somewhere else, that's a problem. Now, time series databases, the specialization, and they're, they're starting to appear not as separate databases, but as mostly as improvements of existing database systems. And the idea is to be able to store and retrieve information from time series, which are information that is saved with a timestamp. So your sensor now says that it's 30 degrees. In a few seconds, it says that it's 29 degrees, and then it continues on. And this information uh, is, you only have this kind of degree and when in time that was stored or other information. And that's happening, not in one sensor, but in 1 million of sensors, because it's a big machine. It's a, 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 a smelting oven in a siderurgic. And you don't want your, your oven to melt. So you need to pay attention to all of those. So how to store this data and to react to it properly or to take a look in the future and see, oh, there was an accident in this oven and it started to overheat. How was the curve before it? We have to retrieve the data. And to do that, you need a special type of database because 
it's not simp as simple as give me the information from data from time A to time B, because in, the, in standard database systems, this is very slow. But if you have a time series database, they're optimized for that. And you have some names here. Mongo now has access has support to it from the version 5.0 on. You have TimescaleDB, which is an extension for Postgres. So you can see that these are kind of add-ons to existing databases, but you also have Influx and Open, OpenTS DB. And the big advantage are these that I mentioned, but it's very limited. You cannot use a time series databases for anything just for time series data. So very specific applications and requires more knowledge than other database systems. Now, these that I'm going to mention in this slide here, they are not databases by itself, but they are related. So you have file storage that allows you to store all types of file. It's used a lot. It's useful for transfer big data, a lot of data and specific data types. So suppose you want to transfer an MP3 file. Would you add that to a database? So how is that stored? It's a certain type of file format. Would you compress it to a string, to a text, transform that into a text and store it into a textual field? Or would you have to install a specific uh, uh, plugin to, for your database to be able to store this information? Because that's not kind of the traditional storage info that goes into a database. So for these reasons, you use file storage. And you have AWS S3, Google Cloud Storage, which are ways to store. And they also allow you to retrieve information. They are not databases itself, but they're related. And there are good things to know. There are things that doesn't go into database. They have to go into a file storage. And you have to know that. There are also on-premises file storage. Of course, that's another thing. And you have data lakes and data warehouses. They are not databases, but they're very close to. A lot of them, you can do SQL querying. And the different from them and databases, basically, is that they are um, supersets of databases. So they have uh, information behind them, below them. They're used for analysis. You store a lot of data from uh, you have time uh, stamps showing how your data evolved in time, and you just dump everything over there. Some examples here are BigQuery, Snowflake, and Redshift, and they're very specific for analysis. You do not store them, you don't use them for your shop, for example. You use something else. So I would like to recommend you to take a look at this video. Afterwards, we, we don't have time right now. But this guy from IBM, he explains very well the difference between OLAP and OLTP. These are terms that help us understand the difference between some databases, and especially between databases and data lakes, data warehouses. So this is a, a good video for you to watch afterwards. Uh, I, I guess that we'll share that in the chat to everyone, uh, if possible. Uh, if I can, if it's not shared now when we're doing the quiz, I'll share it with you. Okay, so this is a great video. Don't, it's five minutes. Uh, don't forget to take a look at it. I don't want to see it. All right. So conclusion. So quick recap. Re at the end, a lot of things covered, a lot of information, different types. Uh, it's usually hard to keep everything in mind. But I hope you have an horizon about the things that you can have access to and the things that you can use, the specific use cases, the fact that there is no better than the other one. You have specific applications, right? So in summary, you have relational, no SQL, new SQL, and memory, and time series databases. So these are kind of the core databases, even though you could argue that in memory and time series and graph databases, are also no SQL, not time series actually, because you have some kind of sort of SQL there, depending, right? So big things here. Uh, new SQL, their own separate instance. And the thing is that each one has advantages and trade-offs that you have to think about. 
So how to choose the correct database for your project, for your scenario, for the thing that you're working on or that you will work on? Or how could you help someone to choose the correct database? So you have to think about the business requirement. You have to think how data is being accessed, the speed, the amount of people, the concurrency. Does it have lots of relationships? Does it have to scale with time? That's an important thing to take into account. Think about ease of use, development, management, integration with existing systems. There are some databases who are very nice, but you don't have very easy ways to send data to them. And that's a problem. You don't want a database where you don't have a driver for your uh, programming language to, to attach to it. You would have to reinvent the wheel and that's not good. You have to think about that as well. And also think about costs. Some of them, you have to pay a subscription. Others are more cost intensive. Others you require support in community is not there for you. And what is the ecosystem? The plugins that I can add to my database to make it better in this and that. So these are things that you need to consider uh, when selecting the correct database management system for your use case.